Bishop, yesterday in your Christmas message, you were saying that Nigeria needs a new strategy and that uh, in your estimation, the Buhari administration has failed. But the same president, well, was saying that he has made a lot of achievements in the area of infrastructure and he is leaving behind a legacy that the next president of Nigeria should build upon. You admitted, of course, that uh, you have seen quite some advances in the area of infrastructure. But you think that the president, still having just 22 weeks, more or less, to go, has left us more vulnerable than he met us as Nigerians. The APC thinks that that is an unfair assessment. In fact, they think it's an ungodly assessment and that you are biased. Are you guilty as charged by the APC? Well, um, Dr. Abati, you know you're a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. But just sitting next to you is a uh, brother, Rufai, who actually listed a, a catalog, which I'm sure he would have, if he had another 30 minutes, he would not finish, of uh, this legacy, which are they? Is it legacy of our still lack of power? Is it legacy of of ASU, of the university being shut down, is it legacy? I mean, what legacy? If you talk about APC, I'm not aware of what APC's position is about my message. Uh, but whatever it may be, I mean, I, I state my mind when I deliver my message. I don't expect everybody to agree with me. Um, I'm resonating the message of Jesus Christ, who was who died on the cross, who was crucified. So uh, don't get it. You know, when we speak as priests, we don't expect a round of, of, of ovation. Indeed, the angrier those in authority that are, the more ordinary people must understand that we are on the right path. I don't speak to insult or abuse anybody, but the facts are staring us in the face. And I don't think that anybody in his right frame of mind can pretend in any shape or form, you know, that we are where we ought to be or that we even arrived at the destination that we were promised. Of course, a lot of things happen, you know, when, when, when governance takes off. Uh, and like the, 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 the cabin crew will tell you, you know, when the plane is about to land, you know, just be careful when you are opening the, the, the locker because items may, may have shifted in the course of flight. So, yes, items do shift. Uh, but clearly, uh, I'm not hearing, even from the APC in its campaign, a long list of these achievements and accomplishments that we want to continue on. I think that the APC in this campaign has also been quite strategic because they know that they're running almost on, on, on an empty tank as far as promises, commitment, and trust to you know of, of government you know is concerned. So really, I'm not saying anything that is new, and, and I always like people to extrapolate what I'm saying with the facts that are on the ground. This is not I'm not grandstanding. There's absolutely nothing that I'm saying that is not verifiable. You know, so if the APC is unhappy, that's actually fantastic because they, they need to then get their act together. You know, uh, I end on a very interesting note. Um, Raji Fashola, the Honorable Minister, was delivered a convocation lecture in our university, Veritas. And he, he made a very interesting point. He said, you know, when a team loses a match, they often say, you know, we didn't lose, we just ran out of time. You know, so I think there is a feeling now that people are thinking they run out of time, is that we must return to the scene of the crime and ask what did we do wrong and how did we end up in the kind of situation we find ourselves. For me, those are the critical questions. So why has progress eluded us? You even talked about the fact that we've had many seminars, we've had many conferences to discuss the Nigerian situation and the way forward without any you know, tangible results to show. You even asked that there must be something wrong with the people because things are not working. Now, we're coming into the election uh, months in February and March, and we're going to be having conversations again like this. We're going to hear promises. We're going to go to the polls to get to vote. What do you think, in your view, is the problem of the Nigerian people in terms of the lack of progress, despite all efforts being made? You know, I mean, I walk across this country. Uh, people meet me at the airport. They meet me on the streets. They meet me everywhere. And they're congratulating me. And they say to me, thank you for speaking for us. And I often say very frankly, please, I'm not speaking for you. I'm not speaking for anybody. I'm speaking for Matthew Cooker. Uh, if what I say resonates with you, that's fine. But this attitude that we can, you know, um, 
more or less uh, leaves out our responsibilities to other people. And that people think, oh, bishops should speak for us, church people should speak for us, our leaders should speak for us. No, politics is about engagement. And of course, yes, we do not have many, many miles. We've not covered a lot of miles in terms of being on the political terrain. We don't even have a political culture. You can see that what we call political parties really don't qualify to be called political party because almost every elections, people are contesting on changing platforms day in and day out. Look at all the candidates who are on the, on the field today. There's nobody who has moved in at least three or four different directions. So to the extent that political parties are seen as just mere vehicles for, 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 you know, for getting us to a destination, wherever that destination may be, the responsibility of ordinary Nigeria is to look at the text of the promises that people are making. And then political engagement after swearing in a president is not about uh, what the president promised. If the president or they made all these promises, it is our responsibility to hold their feet to the fire. I didn't ask the APC to make the promises it made. I didn't ask the APC president to make the promises he made on May 29. I did not ask them to make the promises. I didn't ask him to promise that he's going to keep us safe. I didn't ask them to make promises that they were going to bring back our girls. I didn't ask them to make promises about giving us power and so on and so forth. In all of this, what kind of scorecard do they have? So what is missing in Nigerian politics? It's not that we are being governed by good men or bad men and women. It is that we lack the politics of engagement. And engagement is about confronting leadership with the text of their own promises. So a situation where the media, the church, civil society, all the people in the private sector, or the bankers, people who just believe that bankers and bankers, the people believe if we can befriend the right governor, as long as it's bringing us hundreds of billions of money and our banks are full and we have very good credit uh, cards, that's wonderful. It is not wonderful. Okay? If people just think that because they are in contract and they have managed to land the right contract and that political engagement is about self-enrichment, well, we're not getting anywhere. So for me, going forward, we can there's nothing like voting for the best president or all of these candidates are making promises. Will they fulfill the promises? They might try to fulfill the promises, but things might change. It is the responsibility of ordinary people to remind people whom they voted for that this has not happened. We need to see more boots on the ground and on the streets. Nigerians need to become demonstrate their anger. And they can demonstrate that anger without breaking anybody's property. By just going out publicly with a show of resentment about the fact that things are not the way. We see what is happening in other countries. So we cannot sit in the comfort of our homes and assume that good people are just going to govern us and deliver all the promises they made. Okay, two questions. <clears throat> Deborah was killed. Till date, where are we as regards justice for Deborah? And secondly, on the 18th of December, 38 people in southern Kaduna were killed. How does all of this make you feel? You know, I'm actually sitting here in the cathedral um, because I have mass for children, uh, you know, in another hour or less. Um, if you look out of the window here, I cannot show you. You will see the glasses of our cathedral that were, I mean, of our, of our hall that were broken. You will see the, 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 the vehicles that were destroyed. Our pastoral center was destroyed. And one of our churches was destroyed. For what? We didn't quarrel with anybody. We didn't say anything to anybody. Um, you have a situation where in Northern Nigeria, across Northern Nigeria, you know, you have a reservoir of young people who simply at the slightest provocation, whether it concerns, if it concerns Islam or whatever, whether it, it has got anything to do with the church, the question Nigerians should ask themselves, which can, what have Christians done that our churches, our properties, our hospitals, which are serving the majority of Muslims, are also have become objects of target practice? For example, what did the trial of Deborah have to do? The government, the governor simply announced that this, the, these people who did this were going to be tried. How would that provoke young people to go and start destroying the properties of Christians to go, because they went to the shop. I, 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 we have verifiable evidence of young people going out to show, so this is a car force shop, this is a Christian shop, this is, no, let's pass this one, it belongs to, let's, these things are done openly. When a president wants to tell me about wishing me a happy Christmas, 
I need to hear him say, no Christian, nobody in this country can lose their life because some, some, somebody stood up somewhere and said he wants to defend you know, his religion. People have been killed across this country. Christians have remained vulnerable and in many respects their infrastructure and their businesses remain, you know, you know uh, uh, just, as I said, objects of target practice. You organize a Miss World contest, churches are bombed across Northern Nigeria. You draw cartoons in Denmark, churches are destroyed in Northern Nigeria. As I'm talking to you, when the president says he's wishing me a happy Christmas as a Christian, I need to hear the president tell me I can build a church anywhere in Dora if I if, if I if I want if I apply for land. As it is, it's not possible. I need to hear the president say, professors who are in Christian who are in universities in northern Nigeria, students, Christian students who are in universities in northern Nigeria, across the whole of, of the country, can have places of worship. As I'm talking to you, universities 40, 50 years up till today in most universities in northern Nigeria. The Christian community has no place of worship. So when people stand and look at me in the face and say, we're wishing you a happy Christmas, you know, I need you to walk the talk. So if you ask me, what am I supposed to say? And guess what? Am I, I'm supposed to fix my church back. I'm supposed to fix, I mean, to fix back properties that were destroyed. Businessmen are supposed to find money from where to rebuild their businesses. So, you know, this is the country we are living in. And... It is unacceptable. And because we left a lot of these things unattended, what you are seeing, many Christians have lived with it. We have lived with it. So at periods of this nature, I don't want anybody to grandstand and say that we should imitate Jesus Christ or that we should be. We know what it is. I don't need anybody to come. I'm converted to Christianity. But it should be on record in this country that by being a Christian or by being a Muslim, you've not committed an offense. So I feel and I believe and I know the facts are there. They are verifiable. Christians living in Northern Nigeria are living in fear. Despite our massive contribution to the economic well-being of, of the states in which, despite our being law abiding, but every church you are building, you are living in fear because you don't know what is going to happen. And when these things happen, nobody gets tried. So these are the questions that we need to resolve. The Boras family, as you know, the Boras family, as you know, are no longer living here. They are now living in River State. Okay? Because I'm, I, I'm sitting here as Bishop of Sokoto. My parishioners are moving. They are moving in droves. Everybody is sick and tired. Okay? Everybody is tired. Well, uh, Bishop. In your earlier response, you touched on the, the tensions along religious lines, and in your message, you cited Egyptian President uh, Fateh and also Pope John, uh, the Pope, in terms of their promoting religious harmony. What can religious leaders in Nigeria do to better the lot of religious harmonies in the country? You know, some of my critics, and I wish they were a bit honest with themselves, they said to me, ah, you know, you are dividing our people. You are, I said, well, there is a difference between light and darkness. So yes, I'm not, I'm not afraid. There's a difference between truth and lies. So yes, I'm dividing because there has to be a separation between, you know, they chases out darkness. The point to make is, I keep saying, okay, can you tell me one single day in which a church was destroyed or maybe a mosque destroyed or whatever? Can you imagine the difference it would make? If a president, if a governor, if a traditional ruler, bishop, imam, emir, if they went to condone with the Christian community and are able to make those statements very clearly, what is happening to us in Nigeria as Christians, and it didn't start today, but it has started over a long period of time. And indeed, I have argued, this is what gave vent to Boko Haram. Because when leaders go around making grandstanding statements about what they will do with religion. You weren't elected to build mosques. You are not elected to build churches. You are elected, what, of what use is it for us to have governors or ministers or presidents building mosques or contributing to mosques when we don't have the roads on which we can, I mean, drive on even going to the churches? It's not their responsibility. So the point I'm making is, and CC in Egypt has done things that up till, up till 10 years ago or so, why did the, 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 the uh, Islamic Brotherhood produce a president? Now, the level of animosity against Christians in 
relationship was palpable and the level of discrimination. But ICC has covered a lot of grounds in this regard. And like I pointed out in my, in my, in my message, and there, there is evidence. You, the evidence is there in my, in my message. Can you imagine what it will mean for the president of Nigeria to come to Usman Danfodio, to go to Bayero University and lay the foundation for the building of a church in, a, in an environment of that nature? Can you imagine what, the, what, what, what it will mean to a small Muslim population, whether, it's in, uh, in, 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 whether it is in, in Oka, or whether it is anywhere, for a president who is a Christian or governor to go there and oversee the building or the reconstruction of, of a mosque? These are the symbolic gestures that ordinary people did. But what we have is presidents, governors continue to throw raw meat at the fanatics and the extremists. Because when you say nothing, your silence can be taken as complicity. And this is what is appeasing all this. So somebody goes around and if you look at the rest of, of, of West Africa, or even Africa, Islam, there are 90, 90, maybe 94, 95% of the people in Senegal are Muslims. 96 or 97% of the people in Gambia are Muslims. Why is it that it's only in Nigeria you hear characters talking about jihad? You don't hear anybody talking about jihad anywhere else in the world, except in Nigeria here. Where people are still maintaining a mindset that has moved on, and the political elite refuses. They are taking an inspiration from the poor people who don't know much. Okay. And this is because people are afraid of their constituency. And once you are afraid of your constituency, a leader must take his people to where they don't want to go because he has a vision. Okay. But what we have is people are afraid of this constituency that they harvest for elections. Okay. So you mesmerize them by building mosques or building churches, as the case may be. You are refusing to give people an education. And then you presented Christianity and Christians as the cause of our problem because it's an alien religion. Okay. So these are the issues we must try and resolve. What we are practicing in Nigeria just glorifies feudalism. Okay, with a little bit of sprinkling of the tenets of democracy. These people don't understand what the principles of democracy are. But then democracy, okay, if that's what you want, yes. But at the back of it all, we want a different state altogether. Because you cannot be having these shrill voices in which people are telling you they want to live under Islamic law. They want to live under Christian. We can only have one law, okay, which, is, which is derives all the laws that are derived from the Constitution. But right now, if we are serious and we have a sense of enforcement, then this young girl would not have been killed in vain and nothing happens. People will not be slaughtered in their sleep and nothing happens. Because when nothing happens, as I said, you are throwing red meat at those who have, and this is why, this is where they derive their sense of heroism from. So we need people who have the capacity to understand that, first of all, you must create a line in which common citizenship exists. And that irresponsible, irrespective of where you are, whether you are Christian, Muslim, when people go, when the, the Muslims who are living in America or living in Europe, do you hear them worry about everybody is subordinated to the constitution? But in Nigeria here, yeah, somebody can kill you and he's saying that it is my religion that has asked me to do so. And when I confront my Muslim friends, they are prepared to whisper about this conversation, but no raise their voices. So for me, those things are possible. After all, Obama would not have come to the surface in America. They come, they, 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 Ms. Harris would not have emerged as vice president in America today. Eight Nigerians would not have been appointed to the administration of Joe Biden. We wouldn't have the kind of thing we have in England now where the, 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 the descendant of immigrants is now prime minister. Unless and until you lay a foundation and punish those who don't want to live under the constitution, unless you create a power of common citizenship, would we, for example, I mean, given where we are now and given what Christians have suffered in Nigeria, if you take, you mentioned my state of Kaduna, okay, the governor defies everybody and thinks that, okay, the only people in Southern Kaduna that can do business must be Muslim. Well, that's fine, it does, it does what he believes. But how, how, how has Kaduna become the most volatile and the most disrupted state in Nigeria, you know, in parts of Northern Nigeria today? Why have so many people died? If having a Muslim governor and a Muslim president were the, you know, I mean, a Muslim governor and a Muslim deputy governor were the issue. So all these people who continue to use religion yes. are making our country more vulnerable. So right now we are living as Christians and Muslims. And that, that's why you may have the election. Yes. But we need a Nigerian president, presidential candidate that can tell us 
how he's going to resolve All problems right. of this Thank nature you. when they rear themselves up.